For the remainder of the term, we will focus on how ritual can sometimes strengthen and yet sometimes undermine different social groups within a society. Our first topic under this umbrella will be ritual and hierarchy, and then our final topic of the course will be ritual and politics. People often talk about how rituals bring people together, but just because people are together participating in a ritual does not mean that they are participating as equals or in ways that affirm equality. It is true that ritual has the potential to strengthen community bonds by obliging people to cooperate, share, and show goodwill, but ritual's social dimensions are not always so happy. Ritual can just as easily fortify social hierarchies and deepen divisions. To figure out what is going on in any specific ritual, we have to inspect closely the details of symbolism and action. In this ritual, we'll look closely at three examples, fox hunting in England, second line parades in New Orleans, and offerings to a spiritual guardian of the silver mines in Bolivia. There are some common ways of reinforcing or subverting hierarchy in ritual cross-culturally, and we can see these clearly in side-by-side comparisons. For example, the principle of sameness or the absence of hierarchy can be seen in forming a circle with no one person in an honorific spot. Whereas hierarchy can be seen in some people occupying honorific positions, often in a head position or elevated above others on a high seat or atop an animal. Another contrast can be found in ritual use of food. Sameness can be seen in people drinking or eating from the same vessel, as seen in a Fijian kava ceremony at the top, or when Senegalese host guests at the bottom. This can be compared with rituals in which a few individuals drink or eat from special vessels not available to everyone, or special foods not available to everyone. Examples are how, in the pre-Columbrian period, only the Maya nobility could consume chocolate, and they did so in special ritual vessels in the top two photos. And then the Baba Sheikh of the Yazidi hierarchy, who eats all of his meals ritually and seated apart from everyone else. Ritual sameness can be seen in cases in which everyone performs the same actions or has equal access to the same roles. This can be compared with people performing structurally different actions or not having equal access to the same roles. For example, during the late Middle Ages in England and France, only knights, who were therefore members of the aristocracy, participated in the joust before the king. And in more recent times, in England, only young ladies of the aristocracy and upper classes would be presented to the royalty and welcomed into high society in debutante balls marking the beginning of the social season. Another example is how Catholic festivals for the saints have been organized in many indigenous communities in Middle America. The festivals are organized and in part financed by wealthier men who, as a consequence of this religious service, rise in the religious and political hierarchies in the community. The principle of sameness can be seen in the ritual exchange of gifts of equal value, such as was the case in the Kula Ring described by Bronislaw Malinowski in which participants from different islands in the Trobriand Islands exchanged red shell necklaces for white shell armbands. This compares with ritually bestowing very valuable gifts that the recipients cannot return, such as was seen in the potlatch ceremonies of the northwest coast of North America in the previous century, This type of competitive feasting creates obligation and deference. Ritual sameness can be seen in imagery of circles, such as dancing around the maypole. 
This stands in contrast to imagery of pyramids or ladders, as exemplified by Masonic rituals. The principle of sameness is seen when everyone wears similar clothing, as in this candomblé ceremony in Brazil. In contrast, hierarchy is reinforced by costumes and regalia that symbolize differential status, such as in this ceremony featuring the king of the Cuba kingdom. To explore how ritual can either bolster or weaken hierarchies in society, we'll consider three examples in depth. First, please read James Howe's article on fox hunting as ritual. Howe analyzes fox hunting in England, but it is worth noting that fox hunting is still practiced in parts of New England and the mid-Atlantic states here in the U.S., although not in the same way. Toward the beginning of the article, Howe spends a good deal of time critiquing an article written by Edmund Leach. Try not to get bogged down in the details of that argument. For our purposes, the most important parts of Howe's article are page 278 and then page 281 onward. Howe describes fox hunting in England on page 278 as a, quote, ritual of social class, one dramatizing themes and images about the gentry and aristocracy, end quote. As you are reading, pay close attention to the details that he offers in support of that conclusion. He looks at various elements such as fox hunting vocabulary, equipment, the horses and hounds, the time involved, the different roles in the hunt, access to land, and animal symbolism. Then you will read second lines, minstrelsy, and the contested landscapes of New Orleans Afro-Creole festivals by Helen A. Regis. She describes what are known as second line parades in New Orleans, which are street festivals led by brass bands that move their way through back-of-town neighborhoods on a weekly basis. She focuses on what she calls community-based second lines, which have a long tradition in working-class New Orleanian neighborhoods, and she contrasts these with the staged or commodified second line parades that have in recent years been created for tourists. She argues that community-based second line parades create an alternative social order by the way they move through urban neighborhoods. She notes important details such as where they move, how they are formed, who joins in, and what happens in them. She asserts that there are two landscapes in New Orleans neighborhoods. One, the quotidian or everyday landscape, how certain areas are experienced on a day-to-day basis, and two, the ritual landscape, which is how the same space comes to feel experientially as a consequence of ritual activity. She's suggesting that the second line parades create that ritual landscape, which challenges the everyday experience of social hierarchies in the city and introduces an alternative social order. What I'd like you to think about is whether or not the second line parades do in fact seem to create an alternative social order that challenges the hierarchies of everyday life in New Orleans. In other words, do the second line parades bolster or weaken existing social hierarchies in the city? Do they introduce alternative more equal forms of social relationships and social life in the city that have a long-lasting impact. A final example we will consider are the ritual offerings to the Tio, shown in the film The Devil's Minor, directed by Keith Davidson and Richard Lacani. The Tio is a devil-like spirit, we might call him a god of the underworld, who is said to guard the mineral resources of Cerro Rico. Cerro Rico means rich mountain and it looms over the city of Potosi in Bolivia. Rich veins of silver were discovered in Cerro Rico in 1545 by a Quechua miner sent on behalf of Spanish conquistadors. This mountain is so productive that it has been mined continuously for five centuries. The Spanish colonialists were so excited by this mineral find that they founded the town of Potosi at over 13,000 feet 
making it the highest city in the world. They took the pre-existing form of tributary labor used within the Inca Empire, called the Mita, and adapted it for their purposes. Under the colonial Mita, communities of people that the Spaniards erroneously called Indians were required to give over one-seventh of their adult men to work in the mines in Cerro Rico for a year at a time. In the colonial period, as is true now, the conditions in the mine were extremely dangerous. An estimated 8 million miners have died over the centuries because of this work. Over the centuries, most of those who have worked in the mines are indigenous people, as well as some enslaved Africans who were brought in by the Spanish colonialists. This film follows two boys who work in the mines. The Spaniards introduced Christianity to the colonial Bolivians, but as this film shows, the miners also give ritual offerings to the tío. Tío means uncle in Spanish, but as the film explains, his name may have derived from the Spanish word Dios, meaning God, because the Quechua language does not have a D sound. The film doesn't give an explanation as to why these ritual offerings to the Dio have developed over time. I want you to play the role of cultural analyst, thinking about our topic of ritual and hierarchy. Do the beliefs about and ritual offerings to the Dio reflect Bolivian social hierarchies, such as hierarchies of ethnicity, economic class, and or the legacy of Spanish colonialism? Then, do these offerings challenge those hierarchies, or do they consent and give in to them? In this unit, you might also think about whether it is more likely that ritual reinforces social hierarchies or challenges them. We don't have enough evidence in this unit to draw definitive conclusions, but now that you have become familiar with so many rituals worldwide, you might develop an insightful hypothesis. I look forward to hearing your ideas in the discussion.